As we come to Psalm 10, we first notice that it is a psalm that doesn't have a title in the original Hebrew. Now, many psalms don't have titles. That doesn't make it remarkable in any particular way, except for the fact that it is set in the midst of several psalms that do have titles, several before it, several after. And there are some people who believe that Psalm 10 is actually the second half of Psalm 9. There's a few reasons why this is believed. Uh, one of them has to do with what's called an acrostic arrangement that is supposedly linking the two psalms. However, I would have to say that I think that there are more reasons to doubt this than to believe it. I mean, it could be true, but this psalm rightly stands on its own as a psalm of lament at the seeming prosperity of the wicked, but it concludes with ultimate confidence in the judgments of God. It's a beautiful psalm. Let's take a look at it together by reading, first of all, the first four verses of Psalm 10. Here we read. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Here we see the troubled heart of the psalmist. And again, we could assume it's David. There are people who sort of assume that David wrote every psalm that is not specifically attributed to somebody. We do note that it is sort of in the midst of a collection of many psalms of David. But we just have to be honest, Psalm 10 itself does not specifically attribute itself to any particular author. Now, the idea, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? The psalmist is asking a question that's well known to those who follow God. The, the concern, the, the anxiety over the seeming inactivity of God. God, why aren't you doing something? The psalmist felt that God was afar off and was even hiding in times of trouble. Have you ever felt like that? Lord, I'm in trouble. Not only do I feel that you're distant from me, it feels like you're hiding from me. And Lord, it's needful that you do something because, look at verse 2, the wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. That, that's why the psalmist is so troubled by the seeming inactivity of God. He sees the wicked, proud man who not only persecutes the poor, as it says in verse 2, but he also approves of other sinners. Verse 3, he says he blesses the greedy. And this wicked man also sins against God. Look at it there in verse 3. He renounces the Lord. And in verse 4, he does not seek God. In fact, God is in none of his thoughts, as it says there in verse 4. Now, we immediately recognize that anyone who renounces the Lord is sinful. There's no question about that, is there? Someone who gets up and, and says, I renounce God or I renounce his Savior, Jesus Christ. Anybody who would say that, that, that is a wicked thing to do. It's sinful. But I want you to understand here, the psalmist here puts the one who does not seek God and the one who does not think about God it uses that phrase there, God is in none of his thoughts in verse 4. Those people are in the same category as the one who renounces the Lord. Think about it. Somebody could reject God openly, blaspheme him, be the most aggressive, antagonistic atheist around. They are definitely in sin, but it is also a sin simply to not seek God and to not think about God. Now, people do not seek God. This is a great sin. People do not think about God. This is also a great sin. We as human beings have obligations to God as our creator and as our sovereign, and it is a sin for us to neglect our obligations to God as creator and sovereign. And why do we commit these sins? It says right there in verse 4, it says, The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. The wicked person 
turns a proud face towards God and ignoring God, refusing to seek after him, trying to push God away from our thoughts. These are expressions of our perceived independence from God, our perceived equality with God, or some people even consider themselves to be superior to God. Listen, this is pride. This is neglect of who God is as creator. Every person who walks this earth has an obligation towards God because he is the one who has created them. Now, it could be said of this proud, wicked person, as they're described in this psalm, as verse 4 says, God is in none of his thoughts. At the same time, this proud, wicked person cannot not think of God. Later on, the wicked person does think of God. In verse 11 in this psalm, in verse 13, we see that the wicked person says God is forgotten. God hides his face. God will never see. You see, he's thinking of God, even though he's trying not to. Try as he may, he can't stop thinking about God. I think it's fascinating that even the atheist thinks about God. They think about God all the time. I suppose there's some atheists who, who think more about God than people who proclaim that they are not atheists. They, they do everything they can thinking about God, trying to push God out of their minds. Now, David, or whoever it was who wrote this psalm, again, we don't have a specific author for this psalm, says specifically, let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. This was the prayer of the psalmist regarding the wicked. In other psalms, this statement is sort of a confident expectation. We saw that back at Psalm 9. The, 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 the wicked will be caught in their own plots. Uh, they will fall in their own traps. Here, it's more of a heartfelt prayer. Lord, would you please do this? Now, continuing on, starting at verse 5, we hear about the pride of the wicked. It says this, His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. So here the psalmist is protesting to God. God, look at this wicked person. Verse 5, his ways are always prospering. That the wicked man seems to enjoy constant prosperity, and he does so because it seems like God's judgments, again in verse 5, are far above out of his sight. The psalmist is almost praying, Lord, if you would demonstrate your judgment to this wicked person, they would change their ways. Now, this may sound like a complaint against God, and in some ways it is. Lord, if only you would demonstrate your judgment to the wicked, they would change their tune. Yet, it should be seen more so as complete confidence in God's rule and authority. The psalmist recognizes that the wicked could never prosper unless God allowed it. So now he's appealing to God. God, no longer allow it. But, but notice, the wicked person doesn't think that way. As they are described here in verse 5, he sneers at them. In verse 6, this is what the wicked person says. I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Uh, verse 7 describes them as being full of cursing and deceit and oppression. You see, the psalmist examines and exposes the sins of the wicked man. The wicked man is not afraid of his enemies. He sneers at them. There's pride and sin in the wicked man's heart, mentioned in verse 6, in his mouth, mentioned in verse 7, and then verse 7 also mentions that there's wickedness under his tongue. No wonder the psalmist was crying out saying, God, stop this kind of sinner. By the way, we are impressed at how often in the Psalms the, the wicked speech of men is regarded. It, it, it's think, people think nothing of it today, to be wicked and profane and even blasphemous in their speech. But, but it's regarded as a sin and as a sign of wickedness in the Psalms. The old Puritan commentator John Trapp said this. He said, such cursing men are cursed men. And truly it can be so.
Now, going on to verse 11, he's going to continue this description of the wicked person. He says, He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches. He lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. What a powerful and poetic description of the heart of this wicked oppressor of humanity. It says there in verse 8, he sits in the lurking places of the villages. The psalmist kind of examines the wicked man or men who had troubled him. And key to the nature of this wicked man is secrecy. He doesn't do what he does out in the open. So verse 8 says he's lurking places. He's in secret places. His eyes are secretly fixed. In verse 9, it says he lies in wait secretly. In verse 10, it says he lies low. Again, secrecy and deception are key to the working of this wicked person. But it's not just secrecy. It's violence. He's a bully. Did you see that in verse 8? He murders the innocent. He focuses his violence against the weak. Verse 8 says, the innocent, the helpless. Verse 9, the poor. You see, this wicked person isn't manly enough or honorable enough to openly fight those who might effectively fight back. No, they're always looking to see how they can murder the innocent and the helpless and the poor. If it could be even worse, they boldly boast. Did you see that in verse 11? God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. You see, for the psalmist, this made the murder, the oppression, and the bullying of the wicked man all the worst because he did it all cherishing the thought that God had forgotten all about him, that God would never see his wickedness against the poor and the helpless. You know, it is very common for people to think that God has forgotten their sins simply because it seems to those particular people that those sins were committed a long time ago. That's not true. You understand this, don't you? That time does not forget sins. If you want forgiveness of sins, time won't do it. God must forgive your sins. But people say, well, I've forgotten. I don't remember. Other people have forgotten. God has forgotten. God has not forgotten those sins. Now, when we add this all together in this section, verses 8 through 11, we can fairly say that this adds blasphemy against God to the wicked man's many sins against other people. You can just imagine the psalmist's blood is boiling as he thinks about this smiling, self-assured sinner and the pleasure that he takes in his sin. By the way, one more thing before we go on to verse 12. It's interesting how the wicked man boastfully proclaims God has forgotten, and he finds a great comfort in that thought, at least in the deceptive thought that God has forgotten. No, but for the believer, for the believer, it's a painful thought that God has forgotten. I mean, after all, back in verse 1, why do you stand afar off, O God? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The idea that God has forgotten is painful to the believer, but it is a false hope for the wicked person. So now, after this pouring out of the heart in the first 11 verses, here now is the psalmist calling upon God for protection and vindication. Uh, It's wonderful. He says here in verse 12, Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. The psalmist simply calls upon God to take action. Arise, O Lord. You see, the wicked man finds comfort in the idea that God won't do anything against him. But the psalmist prays, no, Lord, arise against him. Lift up your hand against this wicked man. Now, as I said before, this is an untitled psalm with no attribution of an author. But as I said, it's often assumed that David wrote this psalm uh, 
because it's arranged in the midst of several psalms that are specifically attributed to David. The seven or eight psalms before this are attributed to David. Uh, There's some 20 psalms after this that are all attributed to David. But this is kind of interesting. He calls upon God to take action. And if there's anything we know about this man, David, the son of Jesse, both before he was a king and after he was a king, this David, the son of Jesse, who later became the king of Israel, he was a man of valiant action and a man of a warrior spirit. He wasn't the kind to stand passively back while the wicked murder and terrorize the weak and the helpless. David was the kind of person to stand up and work on behalf of the weak and the helpless. Now, the only exception to this would be was if the wicked man were in a place of God-appointed authority, such as Saul was in Israel. Perhaps, and look, I'm just throwing this out as a suggestion. The text doesn't say this. It's just an idea. It's just a suggestion. But perhaps this psalm was a cry of David for God to stop Saul, because David knew that it was not his place to lift his hand against God's king. Anyway, that's just an idea. Whether it was David or not, we get the spirit of this, do we not? This complaint pours out again, verse 13, why do the wicked renounce God? You see, he's going to answer that question in the next lines. The wicked renounce God because they say in their heart, here it's in verse 13, that God will not require an account. You see, The idea is that, well, God hasn't judged me yet. He'll never judge me. I'm doing okay now. There must not be a God who will require an account of me. I like what George Horn, the old Anglican bishop, said of this. He said, the long suffering of God, instead of leading such a one to repentance, only hardens him in his iniquity. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, he thinks it will not be executed at all. And what an error of judgment that is. Now, I want you to understand that the observation that the psalmist makes here also has an inherent prayer within it. The wicked man cries out and he says, what does it say there in verse 13? You will not require an account. You better believe that this is also a prayer. Lord, require an account from this wicked man who renounces you. Now, the psalmist in verse 14 turns his attention to asking for God's help. Check this out. Verse 14. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Here in these two verses, 14 and 15, the psalmist is very strongly and dramatically praying that God would take this case into his own hands. He says, after all, Lord, you have seen. Did you see that in verse 14? But you have seen for you observe trouble and grief. You see, as the psalmist reflected on it further, he recognized that God had seen what the wicked man did. And because God saw it, and because God cares about the trouble and the grief of the poor and the helpless, then it was appropriate to ask God to do something with it too, as verse 14 says, to repay it by your hand. This was the confidence of the psalmist. He had confidence in God's judgment that God would most certainly repay the wicked for their sins. And God will answer the helpless. And God will be the helper of the fatherless. Matter of fact, verse 15 says that God will break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. The psalmist called upon God to help the weak by shattering the wicked and evil man and to do it thoroughly to seek out wickedness until you find none. Wow, just a dramatic, beautiful passage here. Let's conclude the psalm by taking a look at verses 16, 17, and 18. Here we read, The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. 
You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Don't you love that sort of uh, uh, beginning of the triumphant conclusion there in verse 16, where the psalmist just proclaims, the Lord is king forever and ever. I mean, after all, the psalmist began almost in a state of despair because of the times of trouble. But he ends the psalm with calm confidence in the reign of the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, as an eternal king reigning forever and ever. You see, God had long been declared to be the king of Israel. You can find it way back in Exodus chapter 15, verse 18. And even when his people rejected his rule, as we find in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 7 through 9, where uh, the people of Israel rejected God, Yahweh, as their king, and they wanted a human king, um, he is still the eternal king. Now, again, let me just make a speculation here. And you, you don't have to accept this because I really am just thinking out loud. I'm just speculating. But if David wrote this psalm, especially if he wrote it during a time of persecution from King Saul, then those words, the Lord is king forever and ever, would have very special meaning to David if he's the one who wrote this psalm and if he wrote it in that particular season, which are two things that we don't know for certain. But it is always meaningful to recognize the reign of God even in troubled and dysfunctional times, such as it was in Israel under the reign of Saul. Matter of fact, he emphasizes the point here in verse 16, where he says, the nations have perished out of his land. The, the psalmist here remembers the past victories of God against the cruel enemies of his people, such as the Canaanites who occupied his land. By the way, don't you find it fascinating there how in uh, here Psalm uh, 10, verse 16, it declares that the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, what we would say geographically today is, you know, it is his land. It is Yahweh's land. Now, now we know that the entire world belongs to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Yet we can say, and we should say, that there is a special way in which the land of Israel is his land. And that's the context in which it's being spoken of here. Now, remembering that God previously cast the Canaanites out of his land gave the psalmist even greater confidence regarding God's present help. That's why he can say, concluding so confidently in verse 17, You have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear. You see, the psalmist here is continuing to express the calm confidence that he has in God. God, you will not abandon the poor and the needy, but you will help them. You will bless them. Now, Charles Spurgeon made a very interesting observation on verse 17, where it says, you have heard the desire of the humble. Spurgeon noticed this, that the psalmist does not say, you have heard the prayer of the humble. He means that, but he also means a great deal more. Sometimes, and I'm quoting Spurgeon here, sometimes we have desires that we cannot express. They are too big, too deep. We cannot clothe them in language. At other times, we have desires which we dare not express. We feel too bowed down. We see too much of our own undeserving to be able to venture near the throne of God to utter our desires. But the Lord hears the desire when we cannot or dare not turn it into the actual form of a prayer. Isn't that a beautiful thought? I love that in verse 17. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble, which is an even greater thing of hearing their prayers. And then it continues on in verse 17 to say, you will prepare their heart. That's another marvelous thing. The psalmist reminds us that the spiritual preparation of the heart is a great gift. It's an answer to prayer. It's a mark of God's blessing. 
Again, if I could quote Spurgeon, he says, Surely none but the Lord can prepare a heart for prayer. One old writer says, It is far harder work to raise the big bell into the steeple than to ring it afterwards. This witness is true. When the bell is hung properly, you can ring it readily enough. But in that uplifting of the heart lies the work and the labor. And just like you could raise a giant bell into a tower, God prepares our heart and then it can be wrung out in prayer afterwards. You got to say, you see a marvelous example of God's goodness and grace here. Adam Clark pointed this out, and I'm just going to sort of paraphrase his thought here in verse 17. You see that the Lord, first of all, uh, prepares the heart to pray. Then he suggests the prayer, you'll cause your ear to hear, and then he answers. Isn't this a beautiful thing? God, God prepares our heart to pray. He moves us to pray. He hears what is prayed, and then he answers what we have prayed for. This is a beautiful way that God works. And it sort of reminds us of the verse from the New Testament in 1 John, where it says that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And isn't that what we want? We want to pray according to the will of God. And so it is an entirely fair thing for you to claim God's promise here in Psalm 10, verse 17, and say, Lord, would you please prepare my heart to pray? Would you help me to pray according to your will? Because let's remind ourselves, the purpose of prayer is not to see my will done. The purpose of prayer is to see God's will done. And to the best of my imperfect ability, I'm to try to discern what the will of God is and to pray that into action. Well, the psalm concludes here with verse 18. To do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. You see, the psalmist ends this beautiful Psalm 10 with the assurance of God's justice being applied to the wicked. You see, what began with a sense of despair in times of trouble has ended with calm confidence in God's justice and victory. This is a wonderful thing to do throughout the Psalms. Compare the beginning of the Psalm to the end of the Psalm. In the beginning of the Psalm, I'll read verse 1 to you again. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Listen, that, that's difficulty, isn't it? But verse uh, 18, you will do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Beautiful contrast between the beginning and the end. I, I like this from G. Campbell Morgan regarding this. He says this, Under the rule of God, the day must come when the man who is of the earth may be terrible no more. These were the concluding words of the song, and they make a fitting answer to its opening question. It is indeed a fitting answer to the question. Uh, God isn't standing afar off. God isn't hiding from his people. He is active and he is at work. We need to trust it even when we can't see it, or even, even when we don't sense it. Now, before we leave this wonderful Psalm 10, it's fair again for us to just ask the question, where do we see Jesus in Psalm 10? How does this Psalm point to Jesus? I'm going to suggest three ways. Maybe we could come up with more than that, but here's three ways that Psalm 10 points to Jesus. First of all, Jesus is the one who came to save the wicked ones described in this psalm. Now, I understand the spirit of the psalm, and we share the spirit of the psalm, don't we? Basically, Lord, here are the wicked. Here's how wicked they are. Go get them. And that really is the spirit of the psalm. And listen, sometimes that is the outpouring of our heart, and there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. We, we hear of the boastful nature of the wicked here in verse 3 how he blesses the greedy. We see the proud nature of the wicked there in verse 4. We see the, um, the uh, disregard that the wicked has for God, how he thinks that God has forgotten about him. All. Again, we could go on and on. The, the wicked people described in the psalm are bad indeed. This is what I want you to consider. Jesus came to save the sick 
not the healthy. Jesus came to save the wicked, not the self-righteous. And so even someone who is as bad as this psalm points out can be saved by the grace and the power and the forgiveness of Jesus. Again, we, we, we link our hearts with the psalmist in seeing and decrying the wickedness in the earth. But at the same time, we say, Jesus, we know you came to save such ones. Please bring your salvation. Jesus is the one who came to save the wicked ones described in this psalm. If they would only humble themselves and repent before Jesus. Okay, that's the first one. Number two, Jesus is the ultimate evidence that God has not forgotten and is not hiding his face. I mean, that's what the wicked claim. Did you see that in verse 11? Let me remind you of verse 11. It says, he has said in his heart, and it's talking about the wicked person, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. That's what the wicked claim, that God has forgotten and that he's hiding his face. Listen, if you want the ultimate evidence that God has not forgotten, that God is not hiding his face, it is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, God came adding humanity to his deity and he walked upon us among us i should say not only as the son of god but as god the son so that humanity could literally see his face the face of god could be seen in jesus christ now it's a remarkable thing isn't it it is evidence to us god has not forgotten humanity he's not hiding his face He came and lived and walked among us. No, this this boastful claim, this, this foolish claim of the wicked in verse 11, Jesus himself is the contradiction of it, the ultimate contradiction of it. Then finally, Jesus is the one we come to for help in time of need. I like that line in verse 14. Did you catch that? The helpless commits himself to you. I've got good news for you. In Jesus Christ, no one is helpless. I love what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that there is help for us at God's throne of grace. We can go there and find help at God's throne of grace. In Jesus Christ, no one is helpless. He is the one to whom we can always come to for help in time of need. I love the fulfillment of that. Well, we see, of course, this psalm pointing to Jesus. We see this psalm exposing the wicked person. And we see this psalm giving us confidence in God's ultimate victory. If you are troubled by these same questions that troubled the psalmist, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Those were the agonized cries from verse 1. Realize God has come close to you in Jesus Christ. Spend some time to quiet your heart, to open your Bible, read of the great person and work of Jesus Christ, and say, Jesus, thank you for drawing near to me. I'm going to pray just to that effect right now. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that this Psalm 10 promises that you will help the helpless, that that you are not hiding, that you have not forgotten us, despite what the wicked say. And Lord, thank you that you have sent us this help, not in a committee, not in in an app, uh, not in something as, Lord, you have sent this help to us, not in a technology. You've sent it to us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so we put our faith in you, Lord Jesus, and say, help the helpless, um, restore and strengthen the poor. Those who are oppressed, be their champion. And Lord, do your work in this world. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.